uh, last word has not been said yet and there are still uh, we are knowledge is pouring in every day as uh, dr sashank joshi was mentioning a uh, couple of minutes back so we will try to understand the whole uh, issue today uh, so that after this one hour or so when we leave this platform we will be a little wiser and uh, we can apply in our own workplace and in our own uh, state level uh, this knowledge that we can that can actually help in the policy makers in the different state department to use this knowledge for possibly uh, revising the guideline or or amending the guideline etc uh, we are fortunate to have a galaxy of uh, speakers or the faculty resource persons today uh let i have the pleasure to introduce uh, none other than dr shashank joshi is a very senior person a very eminent physician he is awarded with padam shri and uh, basically an endocrinologist but uh, he is also known as a very eminent uh, internist and uh, he is the dean of indian college of physicians otherwise he is based at mumbai but uh, he is known uh, by all physicians in the country i must say uh, we are fortunate to have him amongst our faculty panel it was a last minute uh, our our uh, effort to get him and he so kindly agreed to become the uh, moderator in today's session so thank you professor joshi for uh, dr joshi to have agreed and we are looking forward to hear from you your vast experience uh, we are fortunate then we have our dr shoibal moitra who is an eminent pulmonologist in the city city of kolkata and uh, as we know that uh, any no discussion on covid 19 can be complete without a pulmonologist's view and particularly when we are talking of uh, a different intervention a relatively newer intervention in reference to management of covid 19 and we all know that uh, uh, up till today our understanding is major reason for the fatality or the worsening of the conditions criticality is affection of the lung and uh, how our knowledge is evolving dr shoibal moitra is there to share his experience and insight in the this area next we have our young friend dr yogiraj roy who is actually infectious disease specialist and uh, he is one of the uh, frontline fighter okay in west bengal uh, running from one covid hospital to the other okay uh, and uh, he will be actually sharing with us his experience uh, by now he must have treated not less than say 400 or 500 covid patients in different hospitals and uh, he was too busy i i was trying to contact him in the day and uh, he didn't find time to prepare his slide and he said that i'll just narrate my experience what i have i'm going through and with of course with particular focus to the use of uh, the anticoagulants and finally we have uh, professor jyotin moy pal who is the professor of medicine uh, internal medicine at rg core medical college and hospital kolkata and uh, professor pal is also known for his uh, other uh, professional activity in the professional societies and uh, in 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 uh, the association of physicians of india and he is extremely busy and uh, he is always for advancement of science not just in kolkata we is bengal throughout the country so uh, we'll also we are also happy that he has he is sparing his time and he will also share with us his views and his experiences and finally we have our youngest friend probably dr shambho somrat samajdar who is a pharmacologist and currently doing his in the final stage of his dm clinical pharmacology he is also a very uh, busy practitioner and with his background knowledge of pharmacology he can integrate and he is clinical acumen mixed with his sound knowledge in pharmacology he is doing a great job great service and uh, also providing his advice and his expertise as clinical pharmacologist practicing clinical pharmacologist in the true sense there are not too many people like him in the country so these are our uh, experts and so far as i am concerned i am a uh, clinical pharmacologist by training i am heading the department of pharmacology at school of tropical medicine kolkata so i am honored 
to be here to coordinate and uh, actually uh, moderate the whole session organize this whole session and i'll be more or less on the other side listening and trying to learn this subject of of uh, the role of anticoagulants in management of covid 19 with these few words let us go to business and uh, our order of uh, presentation should be and all the presentations may i request to limit our presentations not more than say 10 minutes so that we have some time for discussion and uh, i'll also request the participants you must be having lot of questions comments if you could side by side whenever the questions come to our mind your mind you just mention in the chat box to mention what is your question briefly write your name and also whom do you like to address the question whom are you directing the question these are the three things and then at the end we can discuss them okay this is how we'll go that is the rule of the game and the order of the presentation should be first dr professor uh, pal uh, jyotirmoy pal second would be our pulmonologist friend uh, dr shoibal moitra third would be dr shambho samrat samajdar and the fourth would be uh, dr uh, dr yogi raj okay that uh, in fact actually 19 patients and uh, before you can start dr jyotir moypal i will request dr shashank just to say a couple of words and after that dr uh, jyotir moypal can start his presentation uh, over to dr shashank just please so i think uh, you know we have exciting times and covid is having a very unique uh, pathophysiology i think every day we are learning something new about covid and every day things are changing initially we thought it was a typical classical ards then we realized there is a l phenotype and a h phenotype then we realized that probably you know the thick variant of uh, of covid is a different entity altogether there is a lot of myocarditis there is a lot of endothelitis the autopsy studies in covid are rare and few and therefore this whole issue of anticoagulation has become very pertinent now is it a epiphenomenon just simple dvt profile access because of a immobilized patient or are we going to save lives by doing the apt antiplatelet anticoagulation at a appropriate juncture that is really the billion dollar question and we have uh, excellent experts who are going to discuss each of these aspects today so i will probably reserve my comments for the end and professor pal will probably make his present we'll then take it up from there in the discussion thank you and i must thank professor tripathi and shambhu and the whole group for allowing me to attend this meeting thank you thank you dr joshi and uh, now i request professor pal to please uh, start the ball rolling thank you professor tripathi uh, professor joshi for your nice introduction actually we are combating you can now uh, share share your screen professor pal jyoti mai pal please share your screen uh, yes so we are we are we are combating the uh, the covid 19 pandemic it is like a third world war situation there is a lot of almost whole world has been affected much we can give as a therapeutic modalities so before going to the uh, pathophysiology and other details how, why we are thinking of the anticoagulation first let's see to real case one 67 years old diabetic lady admitted with a high grade fever for 5 days with cough and short breath with expectation or admission patient to have some shortness of breath as you all thought of the covid because came from the red zone is covid artificial or positive hr series drugs done done a ground glass obesity there is a it is a case of covid 19 with lung involvement but after two days on hospitalization patient developed swelling of the hand with uh, bluish discoloration radial artery uh, pulse was absent and on a doppler and gradually patient developed gangrene of the hand you can see in the picture and when we have performed the doppler there is no flow in radial artery so our diagnosis was gangrene due to thrombotic occlusion of radial artery in a patient with covid 19 is see another case another 70 years diabetic man admitted with as usual dyspnea and dry cough for 7 days patient was dyspneic on admission 
and patient came from the uh, red zone. As usual, patient uh, swab test was positive. HSCD shows the bilateral cross pictures of the viral pneumonitis. That is a brown glass opacity. But again, after two days, same patient, that patient developed weakness of the left side of the upper and lower limb. Clinically, patient has the CVA and when we die, the patient develop infra in the right MCA patient. So this is the two cases they, they, uh, admitted due to the lung complication, lung involvement, dyspnea, cough fever, but ultimately develop some thrombotic complication. One in the form of gangrene in the hand, and another in the infarction in the brain. So in COVID-19 patient, thrombotic or thromboembolic phenomena is becoming an important issue and one of the major cause of death. Why and what we can do in future. So it is seen that increased incidence of thromboembolism found in COVID-19 patients. You recently, if you go through the NEGM, they have they have published 19 patient series, and these 19 patients develop PVA, that is infarct, during the hospital stay. And this thromboembolism increased incidence in COVID patients may be due to direct virus effect of the cell. Maybe due to cytokine surge, hypoxia, immobilization, and multiple invasive procedures. And this coagulation abnormality in a COVID patient is evidenced by the abnormal lab marker such as elevated D dimer, prolonged thrombin time, prolonged APDT, increased FDP. All these situations lead to increased thromboembolic phenomena, DIC, and life threatening complications in COVID 19 patients. So, issues what we will cover. I will not go much about the pathology because, because uh, other speaker will go. Uh, uh, I will see how much we should screen, whether we should screen thromboembolism from every patient of COVID-19 admitted in your ward and how and should be and who should be treated, whether we should use the anticoagulant empirically, can D-dimer can guide us in treatment, duration of the therapy in hospital and post-discharge and risk benefit ratio. Coagulation disorder in COVID-19 patient, you see, but till now our knowledge was that it is a pneumonia for which patient has been died. It is a pneumonia and ARDS. But in the in a autopsy study in Italy, it has been found that the patient who died with the provisional diagnosis of ARDS in their lung, lung vasculature, lot of lot of embolism have been found. That means that the embolism is maybe the cause lung issue in COVID-19 patient. As we put the mechanical ventilator and the, uh, in the five percent of the cases were admitted apparently due to ARDS, so ventilation is ensured. But due to the embolism, the perfusion is placed. So there is a lot of mismatch between the ventilation and perfusion. So as there is a mismatch between the ventilation and perfusion and there is a uh, there is a problem in the right heart, and so there is more uh, respect cardio respiratory failure. And regarding DIC, in Chinese study, it is seen that 70 percent of the non survivor had a DIC score more than five, whereas only one of one six to survivor has a DIC score more than five. D dimer as a product of degradation or costing five minutes. Almost we have seen the patient who died. D dimer is very high. That means coagulation abnormality may play a major role in the in the mortality and morbidity in covid 19 patients but but somebody thromboembolism this issue is probably recognized by us physicians one issue is because we are more accustomed to do the hrct non cost contact hrct and non contact hrct when you do in a do in a uh, covid 19 patient that seems like a ARDS, that it cannot detect the embolic phenomena of the pulmonary vasculature. So embolic phenomena is poorly evaluated. When we get, when we get the patient to the uh, CT pulmonary angiogram, the later stage, that patient become beyond treatment. That means early diagnosis of the embolic phenomena, we are not much aware. So we are not doing the perfusion imaging of the lung, lung field or the lung vasculature and we cannot give the appropriate treatment we are not giving. That is maybe the one reason why high mortality in patient admitted in CCU and when the patient putting in mechanical ventilator. If you short study, time is short.
so i am going through the big study there are so many studies from the different china and different countries of the euro you do see the can almost everybody has documented in the icu patient 60 to 50% cases there is a embolic phenomena that means 16 to 50% embolic phenomena has detected in different study both in asia and in europe and i told previously in nagm published 19 patients with pva in a covid 19 patient whereas another study has shown that when the dvt profile is as given in 388% there is the no their mortality and morbidity bend is clearly established in catenio et al study french study is a french study published in radiology journal in all critically ill covid patient 25 to 30% ct pulmonary angiogram shows that uh, thromboembolic phenomena whereas in the critically non ill non covid patient only 1 to 3% ct pulmonary angiogram shows the embolic phenomena that means critically ill covid patient thromboembolic phenomena is a very important issue so at least found from 50 to 50 percent both clinically and uh, and both radiologically so on an average 40 percent patients patient admitted in ccu are in the risk of uh, of uh, a venous thrombolysis and thrombolysis of more patient when a patient is in a icu or mechanical ventilator and regarding the d dimer one issue that we frequently see to be the very high it is a more sensitive marker but is a less specific because apart from dvt or thromboembolic phenomena there is any other disease where d dimer can be elevated but if we get the d dimer more than 2500 it is almost near about 99% sensitive so this is becoming a very important issue when we will discuss when and how we will do the uh, we will apply the anticoagulant and whether we should do the ct pulmonary angiogram in all patient rather than doing the d dimer so uh, so thromboembolic phenomena very important issue in in uh, covid 19 patient so so coming the role of the anticoagulant issue is i told previously we are worried about the 20% patient because there is a death of almost 4% and 5% patient going the almost to the mechanical ventilator so how we can prevent that death so study has been conducted because because all the radiological data is coming there is a high incidence of thromboembolism and that can cause the lung change what is the non contactivity that is basically triggered by embolism so there is a lot of effort to put the patient of anticoagulation and to get the benefit out of it so here is the study there is a severe covid patient 449 was taken and severe definition means respiratory rate was high sp2 was 93% less than 93% root air and and the burning cardiac it was uh, uh, partial pressure of oxygen by fio2 less than 300 mg mercury this group is taken as a severe coding and those patient have sic score more than 5 they are put on heparin and 20 mortality was calculated it is seen those patient get the heparin their mortality is 40% versus 60% those who are not getting the heparin and rest 352 patient who are sic score is less than 4 here no benefit that means the patient is more critically ill more more advantage of using the heparin there is a dose i think dr shambo will come out with the doses when because a uh, lot of patient uh, uh, suffer from aki and patient may have because diabetes is a very important comorbid condition those patient become the critically ill so patient can have the ckd before so uh, so uh, drug dose modification particularly in the obese patient is becoming important so uh, for shambo we come out with the dose modification i am coming to the principle of the therapy and regarding the extended therapy how long we leave whether during the admission or after the admission it is seen physician have to have to have to calculate the risk benefit ratio and the risk benefit ratio will on the basis of hospital stay how long patient will stay if stay is more post discharge therapy is more mandatory reduce mobility trivial previous thromboembolic phenomena high d dimer level malignancy and this is to be uh, to be balanced it is the uh, it is the uh, uh, bleeding ratio of the patient on that basis patient have to physician have to calculate whether he will give uh, therapy four weeks or six weeks after the 
coagulopathy management because two things one is embolic phenomena one is coagulopathy two, two, two issues can occur during during this management one if there is only we get the abnormal coagulation parameter but no bleeding and no intervention procedure attempted no therapy is required only therapy is required if intervention procedure is attempted if there is major bleeding give ffp rbc platelet precipitate as indicated and if there is a dic to so treat like a dic and and if the dic what two issue trigger the dic one is secondary bacterial infection another is a hypoxemia oral conducting if the patient come with you covid patient was an oral coagulant and came to for admission he switch over from oral to injectable preparation so finally we are coming in brief what is the recommendation what we will do from tomorrow there is a controversy again controversy we are in the learning phase there is no clean cut data there is no rct there is no big meta analysis still society to society recommendation is changing i will try to summarize to come out after the discussion with a consensus uh, guideline that we can follow in india so international society of thrombosis and hemostasis recommended that all hospitalized covid patient whether mild moderate or severe should get the prophylactic dose of heparin and but and preferably no molecular weight heparin unless there is contraindication britain recommend prophylaxis to be given only to the high risk patient and escalate to therapeutic dose if there is sudden deterioration the deterioration uh, respiratory distress reduced blood pressure there is a clinical deterioration that then you switch up to the therapeutic dose but the international society of thrombosis hemopathy they advocated only for prophylactic dose for the all duration of hospital stay okay. so all patient covid should be investigated for the coagulation study at the beginning and prophylactic mm -hmm. anticoagulant should be given preferably low molecular weight of heparin if there is no uh, no contraindication and whether this dose can be escalated to therapeutic dose is controversial we have no clear data whether benefit from therapeutic dose and bleeding risk when we escalate is not estimated however therapeutic anticoagulants there is some recommendation for therapeutic anticoagulant if patient is high risk patients then we can escalate to therapeutic anticoagulation at this moment as per some of the guidelines what are the high risk patient if there is increased p type increased epdt raised t dimer particularly more than 2500 it is sensitive is bearing 100% raised fdp prolonged immobilization patient have malignancy and hospital admission more than 7 days we can go for the therapeutic anticoagulation and particularly if there is sign of microthrombi induced organ dysfunction or documented or suspected macrothrombolysis done by ct pulmonary angiogram or done by doppler of the limb that that we have got in the uh, in the first and second case we got the doppler study in uh, embolism by thrombosis in, in the radial artery but we are waiting again for the clear data for prophylactic versus therapeutic dose which is better and whether we could escalate from prophylax to therapeutic dose regarding d dimer anticoagulation the question is whether we will use the empirically or based on some lab data because the lab data two issue is imaging but imaging is many times may not be possible in covid patient ct pulmonary angiogram unless it is a super specialty hospital it is not available and during the pandemic time patient is admitting in every way and again to do the ct pulmonary angiogram patient have to do the prone position which is difficult during uh, because in a ards patient again there is a chance of lot of infection spread to the normal healthcare person so these are the few issue for which we may not be able to ct pulmonary angiogram so whether we can use the d dimer as a marker of escalating from therapeutic to therapeutic doses serial estimation can be done during hospital admission this is one guideline that, that is the dutch guideline if d dimer is less than 1000 stick to the prophylactic dose if d dimer is more than 2000 imaging is warranted if imaging is not possible but patient clinically deteriorate therapeutic dose can be given this is more consistent with the british guideline but the, if the d dimer between 1000 and 2000 there is no clear guideline physician should apply his prescription that means with the issue of d dimer we can we can have some idea whether without doing the ct pulmonary angiogram we can 
we can have some idea whether we should escalate from the prophylactic to therapeutic dose. Again, I am repeating whether escalating dose or therapeutic dose, whether we can get the greater benefit. Till now, no big RCT or meta-analysis is available. Empiric therapy, this is the main issue. Because in India, we have to depend on the empiric therapy. Not only in I think whole world is the same situation. Because therapy is gaining the momentum because this of thromboembolism in COVID patients is very high, mortality also very high, clear benefit from the use of heparin, particularly the more critical patient. Imaging may not be feasible in most of the situation. Clinical deterioration, T-timer can be done in most of the places and level correlate with incidence of thromboembolism. So empiric therapy or on the basis of clinical or T-timer value can be justified in pandemic. Thank you. And we should declare over against the corona. Thank you all. Thank you very Thank much, you. Professor Paul. It was really you have uh, nailed the right point, and that is the uh, whether how we should decide whether some of the guidelines is saying about prophylactic uh, heparin use, low molecular weight heparin, but how to escalate. And uh, so far as the therapeutic uh, dosing or Escalating it, most of the guidelines, at least in India, the different state guidelines we were going through, some of those, those guides could access. There is no mention about really that therapeutic uh, heparin uh, using, therapeutic heparin. So, uh, this discussion today, I think, is going to help us and might be with the help of yours, from Dr. Paul, or uh, uh, we, can, we can also think of developing a working kind of guideline and we can forward to. Uh, appropriate authority, competent authorities, so that we can develop integrating that into our guidelines, national guideline or different state level guidelines. Very much again, and before we can go to the next uh, session, you can unshare your screen so that Dr. Moitro, Shoibal Moitro, pulmonologist, he can put up his uh, PowerPoint. And uh, before Dr. Shoibal Moitro starts, let me just explore uh, whether Professor Debasis Bhattacharya, our respected director of medical education, whether he could find time to join, and also our respected uh, director of health services of West Bengal, Dr. Ajay Chakraborty, whether they could manage to join, finding time. If they are there, I'll request uh, to say just a couple of words, and then we can go to the technical session. Professor Bhattacharya, are you there? Have you joined? Or Dr. Ajay Chakraborty, BHS, if you have joined, you would very much like to listen from you. Perhaps they couldn't make it. Okay, uh, let's go to uh, Dr. Shoibal Moitro now. Dr. Pans, unshare your screen. Now, Shoibal Moitro to come up. Yes, thank you, Dr. Tripathi. I must thank uh, Dr. Shambo, Dr. Joshi uh, for all the preliminaries who have invited me in this session, for the very pertinent session in this hour. And, uh, uh, okay. You need to share your screen, Dr. Yes, Mato. yes. Uh, yeah, okay. Is it visible now? Not yet. Not yet. It will come. It will. You will have to just go below in the scroller. Yeah. Shambo, can you guide him? Ah, yeah. Now it's there. Yeah, we yeah. are good. Great. Okay, fine. Okay, so as Professor Paul has uh, very clearly stated, Please make it make it full screen. Yes, I will just do that. Right. Yes, as Professor Paul has very clearly stated that uh, to where we are uh, standing now. Uh, as far as the COVID-19 goes. And as Professor Joshi has, has also mentioned before, that this is an evolving phase. So every day uh, we are understanding in this COVID-19 in its new light. We are trying to develop the new treatment modalities and we are trying to understand this pandemic in a much better way as far as the pathophysiology of the disease and the treatment and continue. So I would be concentrating mainly on the lung because this was the organ which first came into limelight. Initially, the patient came with the respiratory symptoms. But uh, I will share a small, uh, like an experience of mine in 
So when I was dealing uh, with these patients who mainly went into the mechanical ventilation, because it was a few weeks back, and we thought that these patients are having a classical ARDS, but to our surprise, we found there were two things. Number one is that the lung mechanics of these patients were not that bad as we see in a classical ARDS patients. We were not needing a very high P, but albeit the patient had a very severe hypoxemia. And so even when we tried to do the ventilation in the ARDS mode, ARDS ventilation, the patient did not improve. And unfortunately, we lost most of the patients. And so when we initially doing and fitting in the ARDS, the classical ARDS way. So now we know uh, that now as more evolving, some post-mortem studies and other uh, pathophysiologic studies, which is coming into the light, it is, is giving the idea that maybe it is not, it is not a classical ARDS, this thrombotic, uh, uh, this is mainly a thrombotic disease. And systemic illness, which is systemic, involves the vascular uh, compartment of the body. So the main focus then shifted to that these, these patients in the lungs, they usually have a mostly a thrombotic microvascular injury, and uh, which, which leads on to the classical uh, signs and symptoms we find. And does these patients have a markedly maintained lung mechanics, though they have very severe hypoxemia because of the perfusion defect? And so there is a very high shunt fraction. So with this note, I start talk about the thrombotic threat to COVIDized lung. So as we know that uh, this published study in radiology reported that 106 pulmonary CT angiogram in the COVID-19 patients over, nine, over one month period in tertiary care center in France, 30% had acute pulmonary embolism, as Dr. Paul has actually mentioned. So this acute pulmonary embolism, which was encountered in COVID-19 patients was pretty much higher than, than what we usually encounter in the critically ill patients. And in the study, the D-dimer threshold, which was also pretty high, more than 2,000 micrograms per liter. There was a second study, which was also from France, which to point to a very high proportion, that is 23% of COVID-19 in having, sorry, uh, yeah, COVID-19 patients and having pulmonary embolism as detected by the contrast city. The most important thing that if you notice that the pulmonary embolism was diagnosed at a mean of 12 days from the symptom onset. So it is not that they, these patients are being diagnosed on the first day of the symptom onset that they have this market evidence of the pulmonary embolic disease. It is when the patient goes some time into the disease process, something happens maybe on the fifth day or the seventh day or the ninth, ninth day, which triggers or which, which actually tricks the coagulation pathway and leading to uh, this is microvascular thrombosis in the lung and also in the other organs. So the patients with the pulmonary embolism were more likely to require care in the critical care unit and to require the mechanical ventilation. So that, that was uh, the point which was highlighted by this study. So now we know that COVID-19 is more than a lung infection. Why? Because uh, there's the, the references uh, which we have listed it at the end of my talk. We go through the papers, we'll find that usually what we see in a typical viral pneumonia, that uh, there is viral multiplication and the inflammation all throughout the, the alveolar spaces and the interstitium. But in COVID-19, we are finding that with respect to that, there's a, another element which is not that much seen in other virus uh, illnesses as was SARS-CoV, uh, the SARS illness which happened in 2009 and also in the mass. So in this, the microvascular involvement is pretty high and there is lots of microvascular thrombus. And this microvascular thrombus, it leads on to the scattered values of low power perfusion and no power perfusion, which leads on to the rise in, in the, all, the, all the changes in the tissue tissue changes and uh, which causes uh, the patient or which it takes the patient more or towards death or it rises the mortality in these patients. So it affects the vasculature of the lungs and other organs and has a high thrombosis risk with acute life-threatening events 
that require adequate treatment with anticoagulants, which is based on the laboratory monitoring, as Professor Pal has stated before, with appropriate imaging tests as required. So acute pulmonary embolism is a cause of clinical deterioration in the viral pneumonia, but here it was much, much more. And those patients of COVID-19 who are admitted for treatment and isolation, it is important to follow prophylactic measures for avoiding venous thromboembolism. In this scenario, the respiratory deterioration with other clinical evidence of venous thrombosis should raise a suspicion of pulmonary. Now, why this is increased pulmonary embolism is happening in COVID-19? What is the unique in this disease, which, which we, uh, which we I mean, couldn't see before? And what is the thing which is coming, coming up? But interestingly, I was just looking into the pathophysiological mechanisms, and there is a very good paper in the translational research which has come up. Um, and they have they have uh, the case series. There was cases uh, and of the COVID-19 severe acute ill cases, and, and they have studied uh, this aspect of of the patient. And they have found that uh, this illness, as there is a very marked elevation of the alternative pathway and the lectin pathway of the complement system. So complement activation, and it is an important pathophysiologic mechanism in a subset of the patients of the COVID-19. <clears throat> and as we all know, that the activation of the complement is the sum factors of the components of the complement. It causes the activation of the coagulation path pathway. So there is activation of the coagulation pathway, and there is a huge form formation and, and deposition of the fibrin in the alveolar spaces and in the inter interstitial space in the in the lung and uh, the lung lung tissue. And also there is a microvascular throm thrombosis. So this is a very interesting finding, which was seen that uh, this activation of the complement and also that too of the alternate path pathway and the and the lectin path pathway, and this complement activation, though it is seen in this COVID-19, it has been seen in some other diseases also, but we don't find it pretty often in other viral illnesses which affects the lung, which we most commonly see. So this activation of the complement pathway finally leading to the coagulation pathway activation is an important pathophysiologic mechanism which might have an implication of the treatment of this of these patients and you know this is this correlates also quite well with like why these patients don't don't develop these illnesses from the early stage of the disease because complement system is known to be a threshold path pathway so there are multiple complement regulatory proteins and this complement regulatory proteins, they prevent the complement system from getting activated. And so when there is a marked activation of the complement system, maybe because by the fifth day or the seventh day, uh, the antiviral IgM starts, starts being, being released into the cell, being released into the bloodstream and there is a cytokine storm. And also there is a marked activation of the complement and pathways, which actually overwhelms the regulatory proteins. And thus, it leads on to the uh, massive uh, coagulopathy in most, most of the organs. Well, in other studies, it has shown that it is not, not like this coagulopathy, is not like the consumptive coagulopathy as we see in DIC. There's some other patients do have the symptoms of DIC, but in the lungs, in the case series, in all the it was not like a DIC, but it was actually the activation of the thrombotic path, the pathway which leads on, which leads to the thrombus formation in the microvasculature and which, which causes an infl inflammation or the uh, capillaritis in, in those in the, in the organs. So uh, this is what a picture shows that COVID-19 is complicated by acute pulmonary embol embolism. This is a 57-year-old man with COVID-19 pneumonia. It's an, in, in, the, in the A section, it's an ex axial unenhanced, that is a non-contrast CT scan. The 10 days after the onset of symptoms, it shows the bilateral, uh, these are all the bilateral peripheral down, down blast opacities, which we see over here. And when the, uh, there is a uh, maximum intensity projection, slab of CTPA, uh, constant, that there is a multiple, uh, there, there is this the thrombus in, involving the lobar, the segmental, and the sub, sub segmental branches of the pulmonary arteries. So this is also another image by another 70-year-old uh, man, which is also a very severe uh, case of the COVID-19 pneumonia. This patient 
again, if we see the non-contrast CT after two days of the onset, this shows bilateral areas of peripheral groundless of cities. All, all here. Which this is the typical what what now the American College of Rhinology has said is that the typical findings of the COVID-19 pneumonia, and this coronal thick maximum intensity projection, it, it demonstrates the feeling defects in the segmental and the and and the sub sub segmental lower lobe and left pulmonary arteries, which is associated with peripheral consolidation, which is seen in this this patient as we find in the uh, in the non-contrast CT. So <coughs> the thing is that uh, CT pulmonary angiography, instead of of the standard non-contrast chest CT, it is definitely it has an edge because it can and it can actually uh, means find out it, it can actually pick up uh, uh, the, the microvasculature throm thrombotic elements which is not uh, seen in cases of the non-contrast city but but in a low resource country like india of course we have to judge our decision of uh, taking the patient into a ctpa for each and every case and we have to see, see the see what actually advantage we might have have in doing a CT, CTPA, and then initiating a, a treatment uh, of a low molecular heparin or for that patient that has to be weighed, weighed, weighed upon. It is very important. So there, there comes the necessity of the bio biomarkers which can be done and which are uh, which are less expensive, which will aid in the in the decision making when we're treating these this, this patients. So here again, uh, this CT shows the axial CT uh, and the pulmonary angiography in the lung, um, um, and this shows that there is a multifocal predominantly. This the this see it is peribronchular op opacities all all over. The specular sign. These are the, these are all the signs which has been in uh, which has been which has come up in case of this COVID-19 pneumonia. Though, uh, and this is the black arrowhead sign. This is this is the vascular uh, signs. The black arrowhead is showing like that. Then then there there are this is the fibrous streaks, eggs that you can find. This here the fibrous streaks over here, and the vascular dilatation sign. And see all these things, and these are all the signs uh, which is suggestive of, of this COVID-19 pneumonia in this patient. In the soft tissue window, the filling defect uh, with the contrast agent was found in the lat. Uh, sorry, yeah, uh, in the in the in the middle of what? So all these basically these these all cases they have all well, they show that there is a thrombotic event in the lung. And along with that, uh, there are the there are the interstitial and the parenchymal changes, which is which is taking place in this in this patients. Now, when we uh, when I was talking about that uh, that when we we need to have uh, a an important and um, bio biomarker, which will actually which can uh, prognosticate the patients who are going going into uh, the serious disease or who are, who are going into the complications of the disease. So when we think about that, so one one of the parameter which is most important and which is the top of, of every everywhere, as as far as these thrombotic events are concerned, is the D dimer level. As you have shown in the previous lecture, you already seen that the D D dimer level it helps us to judge that when to give a prophylactic dose of, of the, when to change the prophylactic dose of the low molecular heparin to a therapeutic dose. So this is the uh, study which showed that in all the SARS survivors uh, so who had uh, this, this, this kind of symptom, the fever, cough, dyspnea, who required also the ICU admission, but they came, came out of it with a favorable outcome. And on day, see the day nine and 10, these are the areas where the development of sepsis and the ARDS, but in the survivors, the D-dimer level were all through, they were less than 1,000 nanograms per ml. But, in all the non non survivors, we find that we know that there are two two phases: that the development of the thromboinflammatory phase, and the second is the systemic venous thrombosis absorption and the organization phase is of the disease. So, in the non survivors, we find interestingly that C D dimer level it constantly goes on in increasing, and so and ultimately when the patient is very critical, and and, and then the D dimer level is extremely high. So this D D dimer, uh, this this value is not not only aids, it's in in, in patients who is having a throm uh, and uh, their vascular thrombosis, but it also aids in prognosticating the patient, and also it is a marker which can which can tell us that who are the patients who are are 
at the more uh, danger of dying from <clears throat> from this great disease than who are not so this is this study was based on results of wuhan population in which the plasma d d dimer levels were uh, measured okay so again this is the levels of d dimer in the icu patients with a mean of 25 to 75 percentile and if this is is this is the group in which it was the cppa was more or less normal so and the d d dimer level was little bit raised but it remained almost the same and this is the this, this area is is where uh, the uh, sorry uh, yeah where that CTPA showed a positive pulmonary embolism. The study was done in 43 consecutive patients with COVID-19 and the intensive care unit. The pulmonary embolism was diagnosed with CTP in 35 of, of those uh, patients. So here we see the D-dimer level; it is rising. This is this is the this is the day when the CT was was done. That means the patient definitely was was having and the signs uh, suggestive of the pulmonary embolism and then after after that there uh, there was when the patient was put on the treatment and there, there was a serious a serially a decrease in the level of the 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 dimer and this is a very interesting and uh, <coughs> and and slide see it is seen in this is a city perfusion and uh, finding which was a city perfusion study was done in the phase one, that means the phase one means the in initial uh, inflammatory phase in a 43 year old female was proven to be COVID-19 with multiple, there were multiple ground, ground glass op opacities. All these areas, they have these multiple ground glass op opacities. And there it was done. <coughs> and see, this is the uh, actually the areas of the lungs which the, in the perfusion scan. We see that here, that is in the initial phase, we don't, don't find that, that there is a specific area of of any perfusion block but uh, in a in in other ways there, there are other areas is surrounding this area which has a very high per perfusion that means in the initial phases maybe the patient has not de developed a per se the, the thrombosis or the microvasculature the thrombosis which is which is which can be picked up even by a ct pulmonary angiography or a perfusion study but definitely at this stage also there is a microvascular uh, uh, there, there is, is an element of the inflammation in the microvascular that definitely reduces the per, uh, perfusion of, of these areas. And uh, now since we know that, uh, that, uh, the, that there was another study which, which has showed very clearly that uh, there's a viral co-localization with, uh, with some of the complement components, the late complement components like the C5B29, which is a membrane attack complex, and and or the C4D, which is the, that of the lectin pathway. These these all the complement and and proteins and, and the viruses they co-localize in the in the capillary capillaries of the of the lungs. And this co-localization it takes place pretty early uh, early in the disease, even when and there may not be uh, the actual uh, the development of the throm thrombosis. So what what happens is that mostly. Uh, that, that there there will be for formation of this 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 the complement and proteins and so which will go and co-localize in in the minute capillaries of the organ and and when this goes on activation activation and activation and when this crosses as uh, so the action of the regulatory proteins of the of the complement system then there is a huge there is an activation of the coagulation pathway leading to the throm thrombosis so the so the event starts very early when the patient might not be having overt thrombosis of the micro microvasculature. So this is points towards giving a low molecular weight, weight heparin pretty early from, from the disease patient gone into the severe stages. Because at this stage, giving a low molecular weight heparin, it might prevent it, it might prevent the patient from going study has shown that is very much favorable in preparing from pretty early in the course. course the important is that uh, this uh, from in the lectin papa art where the component is the uh, that is the lectin uh, which component 
end of the lectin pathway cause the activation of the lectin pathway it binds to a cdn protease that is a MSP, uh, um, this uh, sars uh, scope 2 virus spike glycoprotein so this is one of the reason why why that that is being, being recognized by the lectin pathway which is a, a part of the innate immune system and it causes the act activation of that pathway and then leading on to the further selling cascade as we find in this in this disease so uh, so the uh, this is a Dutch uh, Dutch recommendation. I don't think I need to reiterate it because Dr. Paul has very clearly and and in a in a in a very point wise manner he has showed uh, showed it that definitely if it is a less than thousand and uh, um, then we give uh, the low molecular heparin in the prophylactic dose. If it is more than two two thousand, we give it in the therapeutic dose. If it is between thousand to two two thousand, that is a gray area. We have to decide. And, and if it is rising, definitely we need to have a CTPA to aid the diagnosis of the thrombosis. If it is not, not available or if the patient cannot afford to do so, there are other constraints, then definitely the patient's condition along with the rising D-dimer level should actually direct the treatment modality in these, these, these patients. So uh, the thing that boils down to the routine DDIMO testing on admission and serial during hospital stay should be considered for prognostic certification and additional imaging as available at the local level. Now the uh, question comes that how frequently do we need to do the DDIMO? Some say it's daily, some say it's twice, twice daily. There are, there are various reports and what should be done in, in our uh, setup, it, it has to be decided by a local uh, treatment or the country-based treatment guide, is the guide there, depending upon what our patient, which is still yet to come and or yet to form. form. So these are the refer references, and at last, I must thank Dr. Shambhu Shambhu Shamalda, who has basically uh, prepared this interpretation for me. I'm really grateful to him, and thank you all. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Moitro. Uh, more or less, uh, you have ended the your uh, last couple of slides. Concluding remarks are almost similar. Uh, converging with what uh, Professor Paul has also said. Uh, D-dimer, otherwise, it's uh, the cost of D-dimer testing, I think uh, it's not more than around uh, 1,000 rupees per test. Yeah. yeah. Uh, around, yes. around that. Yes, yes, around that. So uh, so that is also, to, uh, towards the end, we can come to a consensus that whether we should go for uh, would be the free of D-dimer testing, and then also how it can be um, supplemented with uh, imaging, and to what extent imaging can be made feasible in our setting. Okay, that is also to be decided because in passing uh, there was also a comment by Dr. Paul that to what extent uh, it may be feasible to get frequent testing imaging, carrying the patient, critically ill patient, to radiology, and the particularly in terms of the possibility of infections and. The other other people who are working there, all these are yes. also there. We have to think of viable uh, kind of strategies and recommendations which can be practiced in our setting. We'll come back to this. With there are some comments also, questions also in the chat box. We'll come back to all these after we finish all the four presentations. Now I uh, go to uh, Dr. Shambo Shambhar Shamasda, who will be speaking on risk benefit analysis in reference to use of low molecular weight heparin. Dr. Shambo, please go ahead. Thank you, sir. So I, I will start with actually the first two start because from the pathology days, our second year in EBS, we were learned about that. And we all know that hypercoagulability can be thought of in terms of first two start. And there are three major contributions, endothelial injury, stasis, and hypercoagulable state. All can be explained with the COVID-19 infection. So in case of endothelial injury, we can see there is an evidence of direct invasion of endothelial cell by the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And what happened, there will be a potential cell injury. Other sources of endothelial injury include the intravascular catheters, mediators of acute systemic inflammation, inflammatory response, we know about the SARS, and there will be a more cytokines like interleukin six. And there are some other acute phase reactants also. So they all are responsible for this type of endothelial injury. There will be obviously the immobilization and that immobilization will lead to stasis of blood flow. So that is a And now is the hyperconvulable state. So 
Dr. Shambhu, your your your, your voice, your is, voice is, is breaking. So can you come closer to the microphone or? Am I audible, sir? Now. So hello. Now it is better. Go ahead. Okay, sir. So high levels of D dimer actually that observed in COVID nineteen that actually correlate that illness with uh, severity of the illness. So. there are some controversy and some papers are also there that why we cannot use the antiplatelet drugs why we can use antiplatelet drugs as preventing the this type of thrombotic events or not we we this is a just a mechanism of homeostasis and the, here we should mention that this is not vein this is actually a artery uh, someone actually make the annotation please off the annotation so actually what happened when there is some injury and this Uh, collagen actually bind with the GP one eight two receptor. They actually stimulate the platelet, and there will be more production of this ADP, and there is more production of thromboxane two, and that causes more more platelet aggregation, and ultimately this activation of platelet causes thrombosis. But here another important factor is there from the coagulate coagulation system or clotting system that is the thrombin activated prothrombin that is two A, and another is that that. comes from the prostacyclin which actually inhibit the mechanism so here we see from the pathogenesis of uh, covid 19 in the on the thrombo thromboembolism there is less activation of the platelet rather than there is more activation of the clotting system so here there, there are studies that shows there is more activity of the factor 10a and ultimately which leads to more generation of the factor 2a that is the thrombin generation so our drugs which we, we will discuss actually they actually acts in against this activated factor 10a and activated factor 2a that is heparin low molecular heparin and fondaparinux and there are some other oral anticoagulants we are not talking about warfarin because it is not indicated so regarding uh, our uh, professor jyoti mathal already mentioned about the dic here we should mention that the dic what we found in covid 19 that is actually a chronic dehydrated type of dic generally what happen in acute dic there will be bleeding Suppose is your voice is very poor quality hello your voice is of very poor quality it's breaking all the time sorry for that So you are not very oh, oh. very clearly audible. So please try to uh, appropriate of mic. Probably Sorry. there is a net net problem. I don't know. Am I am I audible now? Yes, yes. Now you are yeah, much now, better. Now Thank it you. is okay. Now it is okay. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt you. No, no, sir. Thank you, sir. So actually, bleeding predominates in acute decompensated DIC. Whether the thrombosis predominates in the chronic decompensated uh, DIC, and it, what we found in COVID that is more the factor a activity and that causes the chronic decompensated type of dic and that is why the role of heparin and low molecular weight heparin is important so generally it presents as a different type of venous thromboembolism like pictures already it was discussed the arterial events are very rare but it is now very important because of that autopsy study that microvascular thrombosis which was found and which actually causes that microvascular thrombosis in lungs which is one of the responsible uh, factor for covid 19 related ards and related mortality 
but bleeding is very rare with COVID-19 patients. So these are the routine testing is already done and uh, already discussed. I am just uh, so. What should we actually we do in inpatient thromboprophylaxis? So in case of ICU, we should have some thromboprophylaxis, and that is generally empirically. Here is the controversy: is that whether we should choose the intermediate dose or we should choose the full therapeutic dose. Full therapeutic dose means we we have to target our APT at least two to three times of the normal value. So that is the controversy, and there are uh, antiguous coagulation should be there in severely ill individuals in absence of documented venous thromboembolism for medical uh, population who are actually not admitted in ICU. We have to use the prophylactic dose, and for the prophylactic dose, low molecular weight heparin. There is already there are some recommendation that enoxaparin we can use it at around 30 unit or sometimes 40 unit also. That depends on the body weight, obviously. And in case of obstetric patient, that is again a very important and vulnerable population, and we should be very much actually careful on that. We should all also always use the thromboembolism profile axis in obstetric patients with COVID-19 who are in the hospital prior to or following delivery, and low molecular weight heparin is appropriate if delivery is not expected within 24 hours. And after delivery, we should use unfractionated heparin when we, we need to foster discontinuation. That means that if there is a chance of PPH or if the del delivery is neurexia and anesthesia or some invasive procedure is anticipated, approximately 12 hours to 24 hours, or sometimes if early gestation that is before 36 or 37 weeks. In surgical patients, again, the perioperative venothromboembolism profile axis is very important, and that is recommended. And this is actually a chart where we can see where we should use the full dose anticoagulation, and there is no doubt if there is, you can see in the upper hand, does the person have a documented or strongly suspected thromboembolism? If it is yes, then we have to ask whether the patient uh, has uh, acute MI, acute ischemic stroke, massive pulmonary embolism, or that is a linked deep venous thrombosis or arterial thrombosis. If it is yes, we have to uh, treat it with thrombolytic therapy. If it is no, we have to use full dose of anticoagulation. But what happens if it is no? Then we have to take the history, is the person already taking some anticoagulant rather the patient is suffering from atrial fibrillation or suffering from already venous thromboembolism? If it is yes, then we have to treat with some short-acting parenteral agent, maybe appropriate in acutely or hospitalized individuals like low molecular heparin or outpatient should generally continue the current therapy. We can continue in case of OPD-based treatment. If it is no, the answer is no, then we have to ask, does the person require admission in the hospital? If it is yes, then we have to assess the level of care. If it is critical care, then again, the question of dose of anticoagulation. We should use some anticoagulation, but the, what will be the dose of the anticoagulation? That is very important. If it is dialectic dose or intermediate dose or full dose, that we have to decide. And if we, we should have some protocol institutional basis to continue specific type or specific dose of anticoagulation and if it is the no that means the patient is not admitted and we have to treat outpatient care basis then we have to continue anticoagulant if the patient is already taking and for prophylactic anticoagulation that is again a very important issue where we should give opd basis anticoagulant and there they mean there there the, that body mentioned actually there is a prior history of venothromboembolism or surgery trauma very obese patient patient remain immobilized there we can think to give oral anticoagulant like rivaroxaban so that is a very a, a small population and we should assess the risk versus benefit before prescribing 
Next, what is the source of this? This is uh, this is up to date. This from is more up to date actually, and they they mm -hmm. actually take taken it from the American Thrombosis Society, right. ATS Society. Yeah. Right. So this this is the area, and if there is a regular medical, surgical, or obstetric ward care, they are also. we have to choose prophylactic dose of anticoagulation not the full dose of anticoagulation and here the low molecular weight heparin is usually preferred now this is again the question and we should have a consensus regarding that the possible and uncertain role of therapeutic level of anticoagulation for critically ill patient whether what should be the prophylactic dose what should be the intermediate dose and what should be the therapeutic dosing and who are the patient that we get prophylactic intermediate or therapeutic dosing so we have to always uh, balance between risk of thrombosis versus risk of bleeding and for that we have some tool and that is a very validated tool that is the padua prediction score where they actually calculate the risk of thrombolysis and if the score is more than 4 more than equal to 4 we should give some prophylaxis and here you can see if we just calculate any a uh, covid 19 admitted patient there is will be more than four and along with that we should also assess the bleeding score and for that we have one validated score that is the improved bleeding risk score and that is also we can calculate it by any uh, application in the mobile and if the score is more than seven there is a increased risk of bleeding we should be use low molecular weight heparin with very with cautiously and if it is less than seven so that is not at re, uh, increased risk of bleeding so there there we can see the primary target to by by the ac2 inhibitor and their production of different pro inflammatory cytokines but the problem what happening in cardiovascular disease that is very cardiovascular system that is very important that severe lung inflammation and impaired pulmonary exchange in covid 19 has been suggested to due to a upregulation of pro inflammatory cytokine that was briefly demonstrated by shoibal mitra sir it may be argued that the marked elevation in d dimer may also be due to this intense inflammation that stimulates intrinsic fibrolysis in the lungs and spin into blood but based on the immune thrombosis model which highlights a bidirectional relationship between immune system and the thrombin generation blocking thrombin by heparin may dampen the inflammatory response so we can dampen that inflammatory response by using heparin or low molecular weight heparin however one of the better known anticoagulant properties of the heparin its anti inflammatory function so we have to actually we can believe on that but we need more clinical trial to prove that but there is a systematic review that also concluded that clinical environment heparin can be decrease the levels of inflammatory biomarkers and obviously this is an area where we should create more and more data so ards is one of the commonest complication of covid 19 and we know that activation of that coagulation system has shown to be relevant in the pathogenesis of ards there is one study that by ozolin et al that demonstrated the median plasma concentration of tissue plaque factor and pai1 that is plasminogen activator inhibitor 1 were significantly higher at the day 7 in patients with ards as compared to non ards so the mechanism contributing to the lung coagulopathy are localized tissue factor mediated thrombin generation and there is a depression of bronco alveolar plasminogen activator mediated fibrinolysis that mediated by the pai1 increase so we should actually think on that and the pulmonary coagulopathy mitigated by heparin so there is a meta analysis that adjunctive treatment with low molecular weight heparin within the initial 7 days onset of ards reduces the risk of 7 day mortality by 48% and the risk of 28 day mortality by 37% in addition to significantly improving the pao ratio and the improvement is particularly important in the subgroup that is being 
high dose of low molecular weight heparin that is more than 5000 units per day so again here is the question of dosing low, of low molecular weight heparin whether we should use prophylactic dose only or we should use full therapeutic dose so the possible need for a higher dose was also noted in a study of critical patients with sepsis filled combo prophylaxis so here we can see the vascular endothelium is often affected by the pathogenic invasion with the resulting that endothelial dysfunction which ultimately leads to different organ failure in addition to pathogen there is a histone that release from the damaged cells also cause endothelial injury but if you see the activated protein c study that is done in some mice and that shows that if we use activated protein c that actually reduce the mortality so what happened so we can find another mechanism that is through its effect on histone methylation and mitogen activated protein kinase that is one mapk and there is another important factor that is the nuclear factor kappa b that if we, that two signaling pathways also be actually impacted by heparin and that by the by impacting on that two signaling pathways they improve the microcirculatory dysfunctions and ultimately decrease organ damage so heparin can antagonize histones and thus protect the endothelium so what happen in the endothelial dysfunction endothelial dysfunction is also we know that it contribute to different cardiac effects and it is increasingly recognized as complications of covid 19 so heparin can be helpful in microvascular dysfunction in cardiac failure because it has been postulated that when, when there is ischemic hypoxemia the subendocardial cell that actually lose its natural anticoagulant properties so for that if we have heparin that we can be a beneficial one so again this we, sh we should have more studies to prove that and another interesting concept is that the antiviral role of heparin so you we can see here in the ex experimental model it, it is one uh, herpes simplex virus model and there they show that the initial contact of virus with the cell is usually the binding of the virus to the heparin sulfate chains on cell surface proteoglycans actually heparins are highly negative molecule they have a very high negative value so it can be helpful and there are some uh, models uh, that shows actually in case of herpes simplex virus infection heparin competes with the virus for the host cell uh, surface glycoproteins to limit infection and even in case of zika virus infection also it also prevents the virus induced cell death of human neural progenitor cells so there is a model on that human zika virus model so i i i not, not get that particular paper but i i, I just found that our online paper that actually uh, used a plasmon resonance and circular uh, dichroism that actually showed uh, the sars cop to spike s1 we know about the spike s1 protein that receptor binding domain actually interact with heparin but we have to again very cautious we have to see the clinical benefits in any of this uh, viral infection uh, by more studies and here uh, here an italian study they use heparin at a concentration of 100 microgram per ml half the infection in experimental vero cells uh, so vero model was used and that was actually injected with sputum from a patient with sars associated cop strain pneumonia so this this study actually demonstrated by uh, professor jyotinmoy pal sir and uh, dr shoibal moitro sir actually what is the uh, finding particularly there is a no no difference in the 28 day mortality uh, between the heparin users and non users as a whole but if you see when the 28 day mortality of heparin users was lower than the non users specifically if the six score that is the sic score if it is more than equal to 4 and even 
in case of d dimer value if it is more than uh, normal that is more than they mention it more than six fold of upper limit of normal the uh, difference is 32 percent and 52 percent so anticoagulant therapy mainly with low molecular weight heparin appears to be associated with better prognosis in severe COVID-19 patients that meeting the sick criteria. That is the criteria more than four and uh, there is elevated D-dimer level. This is six score, we all know that. This is, this is also available in men. So as a whole, if we see the impact of heparin, yes, it is an anticoagulant drug. It is an anti-inflammatory drug. It gives some endothelial protection Yes, we have to explore how much it is antiviral, uh, what is its uh, anti-inflammatory role or anti-ARDS role, improve oxygenation role in lungs, we have to find in clinical studies. So in case of heart, it reduces the coronary thrombi involvement, intracardiac thrombi involvement. There is maybe some beneficial role on myocarditis or cardiomyopathy. So there will be decreased my, my, microvascular ischemia and that, have, that may have some impact on multi-organ failure. So there are questions also, we, we need to get the answers. What should be the effective dose? What dose we should give? And how to monitor the anticoagulant ad adequacy? Here we uh, know that regarding the safety concerns, generally the low molecular weight heparin, there is no recommendation of actually doing APTT regularly but how to actually monitor the adequacy that is the uh, efficacy and because we know we don't know about the exact dose what to be used and monitoring the non anticoagulant functions also we should get some answers on that obviously there are some risk with also with low molecular weight heparin though that is less than uh, heparin that is the bleeding and there is a chance of heparin induced thrombocytopenia. So we have to calculate the platelet count before starting heparin therapy or low molecular weight heparin therapy. And we have to, we should actually check it. If, we, if there is any reduction of 50% by after five to 10 days, so we should be very much cautious. And if there is any chance of heparin induced thrombocytopenia or, diagnose, or diagnosis of heparin induced uh, thrombocytopenia, we should actually avoid heparin or generally in case of uh, heparin induced thrombocytopenia, it is better not to use low molecular weight heparin. We can use fondaparinux here and there are some other drugs like bivalirudin. Rarely altered hepatic functions inhibiting aldosterone synthesis. So we have to check potassium, but this is not to be discussed like osteoporosis because it is a long standing use and it is mainly with heparin. It is not, it should not be any concern with this uh, COVID infection. So we have to always balance the risk versus benefit. So in this slide, actually a U-shaped sl slide, here in the x-axis, we can see the dose, dose, dosing. And here we can see the response or adverse patient experience. So if we using the zero dose, so no dose of low molecular weight heparin or any heparin or any thrombopropylactic drug. So there is the patient, adverse patient experience is high. Now, we, as we are increasing the dose, so the adverse patient ex experience will be decreased. And we, we have to find this dose actually, where we will get the region of homeostasis. And here, actually we get the no adverse patient experience, this region. And again, if we increase the dose, so there will be atrocities. So we have to actually confine in this area and this should be our task. So coagulopathy is a challenge in managing COVID-19. Uh, use of low molecular weight heparin is beneficial. That is shown in different studies, but we have to find the extra coagulant effect of uh, heparin or low molecular weight heparin. Is there any, but it should be individualized. Very much it is important and regarding the dose selection and we have to understand the correct dosage and correct indications. And it is again important for this case, that is evidence generation. So thank you, sir. So thank you very much, Dr. Shambo.
it was very nicely uh, overviewed and particularly i like last two slides that risk benefit analysis if you do not use heparin what can happen and uh, uh, the optimum dose in which we'll get maximize the benefit but at the same time you have also rightly pointed out that treatment has to be individualized in order to develop better insight there this is the right opportunity to get also generate data and generate evidence that it is really benefiting thank you very much but very nicely elaborated now we go to the last uh, presentation this is by dr yogi raj uh, you are there dr yogi raj yes sir please so i i suppose you don't have any powerpoint slide so you will be sharing no, your experience okay please go ahead dr yogi raj we have introduced you in your absence here go ahead oh, okay sir thank you actually i am bit late i was yeah. in sasto bhavan right uh, sir actually uh, we are uh, seeing this epidemic in the last part we are lucky to be uh, as a last country on of the last country like it started in china then went to west and they generated data with that data we can work upon that is a rare possibility usually we don't have this kind of situation but we are lucky initially when the epidemic started people thought that uh, this is uh, uh, like previous experience of viral Uh, fever epidemics, viral respiratory tract infection epidemics, like uh, MERS or uh, previous influenza epidemics. What the ma major concern of the influenza is secondary infection, that is secondary bacterial infection, followed by sepsis. And in last uh, two to three years, there have been data from Netherlands that showed that in a uh, influenza patient who is a severe influenza on ventilators for more than 7 days the aspergillus is also a one of the dangerous uh, thing uh, that can cause uh, increased mortality so that was the our baseline knowledge on respiratory viral infection causing mortality uh, that was based on mostly on influenza now it was in the initial part of the uh, uh, epidemic in the china and early part in uh, when middle east started to have this thing but with time we generated data and we found the science uh, after the generation of data found that it's not that all the patients who are dying are having sepsis or not fitting into typical parameter so there may be some hitch which we are missing so and uh, studies uh, uh, found that there are multiple uh, infarction in the lung uh, as shown by ctpa and where the patient don't have dvt so that suggested there is something going on which is not a typical of pulmonary embolism that what we usually see if there is a dvt followed by pulmonary embolism and uh, a catastrophe here there was something in the ctpa that suggested uh, embolism but uh, there was nothing in the legs so there could be some mechanism which is causing something in the lung and leading to this kind of catastrophe and It, it, uh, it was the start in uh, in the march i think in the march and early part of april and there also the uh, studies by inten intensivist they found that that what we expect in ards is not matching with the character of uh, deterioration in this group of people so what we usually expect in ards the pathophysiology of shunt that is not here majority of patients are not resembling shunt like patients they are resembling like vq mismatch so it is always it is also unusual for ards so there are area to work upon where we can uh, tell there is something different so after further research we found that there are uh, something in the lung as microthrombi 
in various post mortem lung biopsies in the mid april so that uh, initiated the thought of giving low molecular heparin wet heparin or heparin uh, we'll discuss later uh, as to prevent this thrombosis situation so this is the current situation when we started this epidemic in the uh, mid of uh, uh, mid of uh, march and we found that most of the people in west bengal in idbg are stable young without comorbidity patients but at time after after 2 to 3 weeks we started to get aged people with comorbidities and coming with requirement of oxygen so initially we didn't give any antiviral so called antiviral or any thromb thought of any thromboprophylaxis in young population and the most of the people uh, went home but when sick patients started to come we started uh, thinking some different way as still we uh, as we work in a uh, hospital where we don't have ctpa at that time and still now also and also we don't have any facility of doing d dimer or ferritin uh, we decided to start low molecular weight heparin uh, from mid april in a prophylactic dose we we give it uh, to this not to the young co uh, non comorbid patients we but we uh, selected the group of people of aged more than 42 uh, more than 45 along with multiple comorbidities that are not controlled uh, and, and if they don't have any direct contraindication of giving low molecular weight heparin and in this approach uh, we have given around 20 or 25 patients low molecular weight heparin and uh, touched no patient develop severe disease in this stage group and with comorbidities but there is a hitch because uh, we see lot of people are dying everywhere not in uh, calcutta in mumbai also they are usually dying within 48 hours of coming to the hospital setting and getting the diagnosis late but in this group of people uh, we are not able to do anything with low molecular weight heparin here also but we have not given it in therapeutic dose because we don't have the facility of d dimer till now in our hospitals so i have a chat with my friend working in kem uh, he he yesterday told me that he had his 100th death of covid and uh, almost his experience is same that most of the people are dying uh, within 4 hours of coming if some people who uh, uh, receive heparin and uh, have come early uh, with uh, moderate disease they uh, develop severe disease and also on uh, with some uh, high flow nasal uh, oxygen therapy they recovered and uh, they are being continued heparin at home also right now they are planning to continue uh, the anticoagulation for a longer duration uh, i do, i know there is no such recommendation but they are very skeptical they are continuing this uh, low molecular heparin or uh, they are saying that rivaroxaban for say uh, they will planning for month or like or one or two months they will that will they decide later and uh, in a patient who has a cytokine storm there are uh, possibility of late surge of infection due to immune paralysis and that can also lead to stimulation of again inflammatory pathways also so continuation of anticoagulation in a recovered severe or moderate patient is has uh, has to be worked upon and more studies quite on that but giving anticoagulation 
giving anticoagulation to a stable mild or mildly symptomatic young patient without comorbidity i don't think it's a very uh, i just too optimistic i think but because most of the patient uh, are getting well without anything uh, so we should consider this is as a uh, research tool and should go on to generate data because uh, now uh, the, the data of west has to be evaluated in east with our host and our environment uh, so right now I, I am using low molecular heparin for the aged people with comorbidities uh, and without any major con bleeding contraindication uh, we are using it now this is very interesting that without any uh, guidance the otherwise the textbook this thing or up till now whatever uh, we have learning from other sources body, body, body. basically uh, they are all guiding that uh, d dimer is the biomarker and you have to be guided with uh, the 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 cut off of the number whether it is 1000 or it is say uh, more than 2000 etc etc at what dose you will be doing whether prophylactic or whether therapeutic dose and then uh, what's going to happen 1000 to 2000 say gray zone etc et but then you are working in an environment where there is no facility for d dimer on a re regular basis but at, at the same time i don't know whether uh, in the same city because uh, you are working in a government setup but in the same city there might be also corporate hospitals who are relatively has the luxury of getting the uh, d dimer on a regular basis maybe daily or alternate day or whatever or even more than once per day so uh, under this situation i think if we think of going ahead and trying to develop a kind of uh, working guidelines in indian setting we should have all these options left and you are very right that there is a huge need for our own data generation our own evidence generation and this is the appropriate time we have so many patients even today and uh, if we can really uh, generate objective data and objective evidence that would be great now let us now hear from uh, uh, dr joshi and uh, with your uh, vast experience and your insight please try to analyze what we have heard in the last four uh, presentations and give your uh, thought to it and how we should also plan for the coming say couple of weeks or three weeks how we should take up this initiative uh, uh, for, with translated into follow-up actions as we leave today's platform what should we be doing in the coming couple of weeks or three weeks for evidence generation data generation development of protocol we, we need your guidance dr joshi please oh thank you I think uh, all the four speakers made some excellent points and I think at Maharashtra and Mumbai where we are seeing the peak of this uh, Indian pandemic, <clears throat> we have looked at this very critically. In fact, uh, what Yogi Davas was saying at KM Hospital, every day I speak to Dr. Nadkar who is an HOD and academic dean there who is an editor of our Japi journal. And uh, you see the point is that we need to understand four or five things. First thing is that what is clear cut beyond reasonable doubt? If you have critically ill COVID in the ICU, you need to give DVT dose of an LMW. So that part is clear cut. I don't think there is any debate on that. The only debate is the dose and that probably can be driven by BMI. The second debate is whether therapeutic dosing is needed or not. And third is, are we seeing the second phenotype? So a couple of weeks back, uh, Dr. Rahul Pandit, myself and the task force people, we talked to residents from KM hospital who are managing COVID. We talks, uh, talks, We have an infectious disease hospital called Kasturba Hospital and Nair Hospital also in Mumbai. And there, the associate professors told us very clearly that they were seeing a subset of patients of COVID who were coming like hunter-like hemorrhages. So that means, you know, the tubes were full of blood. And they had patients who survived longer. What Yogi Raj was saying is that KM people are coming right at the end. So most people are coming with saturations of 50 and 60 and within 4 to 24 hours they are gone. So virtually it is very difficult and they all have comorbidities, all the deaths. We are looking at a death audit also and they all have deaths. In this it is too late. But people who will have moderate to severe COVID who will survive for maybe anywhere between 7 to 10 days that is the scenario where we need to look at 
the role of low molecular weight heparins in a more critical way. It is impossible, and we also have public hospitals. Similarly, we have private hospitals, whether it is Lilawati Hospital, Fortis Mulund Hospital, Bridge Candy Hospital, Hinduja Hospital, where also facilities are there. You can do even D-dimer twice a day. We can do everything there. You can, you know, we can even do the extended studies of of, of coagulation parameters. But we need to be mindful that we will have to have a system which is simple and straightforward. So I think the first consensus which probably we can arrive at is that critically ill has an element of coagulopathy. So what is fundamental of COVID? One thing is very clear that the cardiopulmonary injury of COVID is because of a local activation of renin angiotensin system. That is clear cut. And I think that leading to a thrombogenic state and leading through thrombosis or endothelial dysfunction, which Dr. Shambo very nicely said, probably whether heparin has a role, whether it is antiviral, whether it has pleiotropic role, whether it is an extracoagulant role, is one issue. So the venous thromboembolism, which was seen predominantly in China, because they didn't give VT prophylaxis, is something which we cannot repeat that mistake anywhere in the country. And I think that is, I think, very clear cut. So DVT prophylaxis, DVT dose done, unless there is a contraindication. So that part is clear cut. What about the dose? Probably low dose is also clear cut. The therapeutic anticoagulation is a challenge where probably we need to do the, and I think I love the slides which Dr. Shambo presented, a risk balance approach. Use the risk score, use the, the good score and the bad score and balance and take an individualized approach and see the length of stay because it will all depend on the outcome length of stay you know whether the patient came we gave brain prone position you know high flow nasal ventilation followed by mechanical ventilation the approach will be different rather than somebody who is solidly going downhill you know whether cytokine storm was present or absent lot of covariables with it whether myocardiosis was present or absent so probably we will have to evolve an individual approach an individualized approach for these patients. So I think two good things which came out from all the speakers is that we need some certainty and some uncertainty. The certainty is that DVT dose profile axis is unless contraindicated is necessary. That I think that that I don't think if anybody has a debate, we can debate that. And the second thing which we need to do is the further individualization and stratification Probably we'll need to take some scores which Dr. Sambo uh, told us and individualize them. And will also depend upon the survival time of the patient inside the hospital setup. The longer the patient will survive, the more relevant this will become. And the shorter the patient will survive, I am not so sure how it will be there. The third thing which was debated is D-dimer, the frequency of D-dimer. Whatever I spoke to all our intensivists who are managing in private setups in our hospitals where D-dimer is available, most of them feel that a daily or an alternate day D-dimer is good enough. You know, you don't have to really push yourself and stretch your resources, but an alternate day D-dimer is good enough is what they felt. I would definitely like to take opinion from uh, Dr. Moitra and uh, Dr. Yogi Raj and others. What do they feel about D-dimer and frequency of testing apart from Dr. Shambo and our Dr. Jyotir Paul, how do they feel it? How frequently it should be done? Ideally, daily would be great, but even alternate day is fine. And then doing a certification, you know, based on the values. Because if the value is clearly about 2000, I think it's a no brainer. It's only between uh, 1000 and 2000 where Dr. Jyotir Paul very nicely said there are challenges. The other thing which we also probably need to discuss in a discussion here is role of the <coughs> oral anticoagulants, which are non-heparin-like. That is number one for long term. And second is I saw a lot of questions on the chat box on the role of <coughs> aspirin, lotus aspirin. And there's been a lot of, you know, uh, WhatsApp university related, uh, uh, you know, uh, <coughs> nowadays, you know, we are competing with Google and WhatsApp. evidence base is competing. That is the biggest threat to evidence base today. Is a mini quasi WhatsApp science. And I saw a lot of, uh, you know, antiplatelet activity of aspirin, but there could be a role. So I think maybe we can quickly ask our uh, Dr. Paul, Dr. Moitra, 
uh, Dr. Shambho and Dr. Yogi Raj, two things. The role of uh, non-heparin oral anticoagulants, their potential. And second, maybe what is their thoughts on uh, low-dose aspirin. And probably then, probably, Dr. Tripathi, we could just take a couple of questions and summarize. Thank you. Well, regarding uh, dimer, I wish to do it daily. I want to do it daily. And I'm planning for that also. And probably will uh, able to do in from the next to next week. Uh, uh, from 7th day to 14th day. But I found that 7th day to 14th day of the illness is the danger period. So if I could do it daily um, from 7th day to 14th day, uh, then it will be best. And regarding oral anticoagulation, uh, non-heparin, uh, I'm uh, not very sure about it. Uh, I'm not clear about it. And uh, until I get, uh, till I get uh, D-dimer or CTPA, I wish to continue this approach because uh, in research poor setting, I have to give That's something. That's a fair point. Point taken, Dr. Maitra, and then Dr. Shambhu and Dr. Jyotir. My point. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. I would like to say that what we do in in our setup, we now usually have this categorization of the COVID nineteen patients in A, B, C. We have A, B one, B two, and C. So what we do is that in all the patients who are in category C. That means there are seriously ill patients in the ICU. We do the daily D-dimer testing as, as here it is available daily. In, in the other patients who are in the category B1 or the B2, we are doing the alternate day D-dimer testing. And that is giving us fairly good, uh, good, good result. Uh, means and we are able to prognosticate and use the heparin. CTPA is only done in those cases where we are able to do so because it, it requires a close a connection with the radiology department and it, it's it's a, it's a patient to be transferred to our Dr. Uh, Paul? He's lost. Yes. Yes, Regarding uh, D-dimer, most of the study, particularly the Netherlands, they have done the uh, alternate day. And uh, ideally what Jogira has told, every day may be good, but maybe some uh, in resource constraints uh, countries, there may be some problem with mm -hmm. the financial problem. So uh, we can follow the every alternate D-dimer and what they have done, they have watched whether there is sudden jump from the D-dimer level from below 1000 to 2000 or above more. And that because uh, uh, city pulmonary angina is a dream in our country. We forget about this thing. What we can do, we can observe jump of D-dimer or clinical deterioration. That point of time, we can think about the therapeutic uh, uh, therapeutic dose of the uh, heparin, considering the risk benefit ratio and contraindication. That is one issue. Uh, regarding aspirin, there may be theoretically role of aspirin in preventing the thrombosis because you know there is two arms. one is the uh, uh, platelet one is the coagulation platelet user initiate and coagulation process is consolidated and more the smaller vessel coagulation is more dependent on the platelet uh, thrombosis and larger is the coagulation so and aspirin is now in the phase three trial whether it can prevent the it can be useful in coronavirus infection this is the phase three trial at this time we cannot say clearly that it has a profile definite so, Dr. Pa, sure. Dr. Moitra has, I think, joined us back. Dr. Moitra, we lost your voice for some time. So, could you make some of your comments on yes, that, yes. on aspirin? So, and secondly, yeah, Dr. Paul, yeah. I just had so, a quick so comment that, yeah. that in asymptomatic people, <clears throat> now the Ministry of Home Affairs has said that you can do homebound care. So, do you think there's a role for aspirin in that? Maybe we'll come back to the Moitra. Yes, in our hospitalized patients, we are not giving the low dose as aspirin. And since and we know we are doing this as hello, am I audible? Yes, you hello. are audible. You are audible. Go hello. ahead. Hello. You are audible. Yes. Go ahead. Yes, and uh, we know that. Yes, yes. Thank you, sir. He's lost again. Yeah, so, again. so my point regarding the oral anticoagulant, uh, actually there were two trials of post-discharge uh, prophylaxis actually. 
that is one apex trial and another is marina trial they use river oxaban which is a factor 10a inhibitor and uh, they use 10 mg daily dose for allow, around 40 days and they get some benefit but again the inclusion criteria for that particular trial apex and marina was the immobile yeah, mostly the immobilized patient and the older patient and the older age was more than 65 so we have to all that that is why we have to weigh before uh, bleeding uh, risk and decision then we can actually make our decision actually before prescribing this factor 10 inhibitors like for long duration and most of our patient will not come in follow up also that is again a concern so, but yes, there, there are some uh, trials which happens with the prophylaxis uh, for thromboembolism in discharge patient, OPD basis. So we can consider that. And, but there is no trial on actually the asymptomatic patient or the OPD basis not admitted patient uh, on the different anticoagulants. Uh, they, in the uh, American Society of Thromb, that is ATS, they actually recommend if there is prior history of venous thromboembolism or recent surgery drawn or, or any trauma history, patient is immobilized, then we can think that, all, that, that also depend on the clinical judgment about the rivaroxaban use. Can, I, can I, I make a comment here? Uh, can can I make a comment here? My question is that in, in COVID-19 patients, who are otherwise who have whose condition has been reversed okay with heparin therapy low molecular weight heparin in the hospital and who is at a situation when the clinician feel that he can be discharged from hospital okay even then are you expecting that the the pathogenetic process which is responsible for thromboembolism pulmonary thromboembolism or otherwise there could be again there is a possibility of the same progression take place after the patient is discharged that means i am questioning the rationale for anticoagulation to continue even after the patient is discharged because when the patient is discharged you cannot monitor the treatment to that extent and then what you have gained in the hospital stay you may be you may be losing the battle after you are sending the patient home so this is my concern Yes, sir. Uh, sir, uh, please go ahead. Hello. 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 Yes, you are audible. Hello. Please. Yes, yes. Uh, sir, uh, this is a very pertinent question, and this is uh, answered by one of the thing that we need to know that whether a COVID nineteen patient and who who had a very severe illness. And does this illness as make the patient more prone to the subsequent event of a venous thromboembolism later, right, later on? Right. So this is the most important factor because we know that if the patient had the other comorbidities which are linked with the increased incidence of venous thromboembolism, in them it is there is no debate. It is very clear we need to continue with the with the long long term um, um, uh, access with uh, with any anticoagulants, any other anticoagulants. Yeah. but in a patient who did not had any comorbidities who had a serious covid 19 illness and came out of it does this covid 19 illness impose an increased risk of having a future venous thromboembolic event in them this question i think we don't have the answer yet Right. And because uh, so we, we need to have uh, the uh, the studies which we should be available by maybe uh, we are we don't have the answer we don't have any evidence to say that that it increases the chances of a, a, a means relapse of venous thromboembolism in this in this patient so continuing with a, a long term prophylaxis with the anti coagulant at this stage it, it won't be backed by a, a, a pathologic mecha mechanism in, in this patient. So we, we don't have the evidence of, of that. So we have then regarding taking the risk benefit ratio, I think we, it, will, it will be more on the risk uh, because still until we, we get the evidence, yes, it imposes increased chances of the venous thromboembolism later in this patient. I think uh, this, this answer will take some time to come when we'll have a, a, a proper uh, evidence-based answer to this question. Uh, may I can make a comment? Yes, yes. yes. Actually, uh, rationality of using the anticoagulant beyond discharge is 
cytokine surge comes after 13 days. That means the late part. So it has been seen that even after the patient become clinically better, improved, and discharged, high level of inflammatory marker remain in the circulation. So it is postulated even after discharge, there is chance of developing the different types of thrombomolic phenomena. That is why it is it is postulated that uh, anticoagulant should be continued. But again, the hitch is you have to calculate by the risk benefit ratio. Not only of the using the position, also how long you use. If the patient has malignancy, whose embolic uh, development of embolic phenomenon is high, you have to increase, you have to give for the longer days. If the patient has prolonged immobilization, if the patient has mechanically ventilated, your duration, if there is risk is less, you have to give prolonged uh, anticoagulation for better benefit. In this, in this way, you have to calculate how long we will give and whether we will give. But cytokine SARS, the secondary cytokine SARS that you are mentioning, that is 13th day, 1-3. Uh, yes. So 1-3. In the late part, cytokine SARS comes and it persists for prolonged, even after discharge. No, but in I that case, if, if it is if it is 13 days, but most possibly, most of the patients who are going into a critical stage, the average hospital stay will be perhaps more than 13 days. No patient, I can comment, sir. No patient actually uh, don't get negative within 13 days. Usually, uh, uh, we see patients more than uh, 14 to 20 days. Right. Hospital stay, sir. Right. That is the problem. Uh, actually, we don't know okay. not much of this thing. Right. Average duration is 21 days. Average duration, no, sir, average duration is uh, more than 14 days. Right, right. Yes. Yeah, as, as Dr. Moitro yeah, Mo Mo said, uh, Dr. Bal and I think I agree with Dr. Moitro, we need to, this is an evolving evidence. And most of the documents are live documents. So Dr. Tripathi was asking me what is there in the Maharashtra Task Force guidelines. Right. So that is spelled out very clearly. All written down in the guideline is do DVT profile access and individualize the patient. Therapeutic dosing is only recommended in individualized cases and we have kept it open. But till we don't get appropriate guidance, which will take probably a couple of weeks to come, I don't think we can make any comments in this COVID with certainty. But only thing is look for a different phenotype. So that's something which we know. I agree with Dr. Palki, we need to probably get that you know, that delayed storm pick up, but that's a little challenging. The critical threshold or which we call as an infliction point also needs to be identified. Now, after most people know that the viral replicative phase of the virus after 10 days is not there. You might have a positive RT-PCR test, but it may not be a replicative virus. So that's another question. But whether that will trigger a storm or if that storm has already started, unless we have biomarkers to know, a rising IL-6 value, we really cannot conclude. So it's right now we are more groping in the dark. We are also not doing autopsies. So I think, I don't know whether in West Bengal, but at least in Maharashtra, no. we are not doing autopsies. No, no, Til, no. Till we don't get our own autopsy data, again, it will be not easy to understand the actual, you know, uh, clinical pathological correlation of, of this whole phenomenon. I have made a suggestion to our team to do at least limited biopsies so that at least we get some granularity on the type of pathology we are seeing in the lungs in the myocardium i don't know whether that has been done uh, you know after death in in in, in west bengal but it is not easy to understand whatever autopsy data is published one thing is very clear cut that there is endothelitis and there's an endothelial dysfunction and there is a procoagulant or a coagulopathy which is there and that needs some circumvention. So I think we'll have to come out with some, some things which are open and some things which will be expert opinion. So some things which are, except for the DVT, which is everything else is going to be open. And we will have to sort of keep it like an open document or a live document. Or I like Dr. Tripathi of word, interim, interim document. Interim document. Right. Interim document. <laughs> right. Yes. Yes. So, uh, uh, is there any other? Uh, I think I think uh, Dr. Joshi has gone through that chat. Uh, these thing questions that have been put in the chat box. Uh, I suppose that most of those uh, issues have been already discussed. 
Uh, 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 sir, uh, actually, uh, I, I, I want sir, to get, sir, get the I... answer which uh, of the question which Dr. Uh, Professor Jyoti is that is use of aspirin uh, uh, in asymptomatic, asymptomatic mild uh, cases of COVID-19 were asked to remain in the homebound. So, I answer uh, expert. Hello. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, uh, Dr. Sir, uh, uh, sir, yeah. Hello. Dr. Chiranji. Dr. Bhakti, please go ahead. Uh, your question is whether we can use the aspirin in homebound asymptomatic persons. Is it so? Hello? He's like Dr. Jyotir Paul, because the Sorry. home monitoring of asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic individuals has been yes, recommended, yes. would it be yes. worth looking at this aspirin at home? Now, this is a very controversial area. There is no guidance on this. But what are your thoughts on this? Uh, this there is a trial is going on whether whether can be used. That is in the phase three trial. We cannot at this moment we cannot say from the evidence that it is helpful. But theoretically, it can be beneficial. Theoretically, because Shamba has shown correctly. Because you see, because the embolic phenomena first there is a embolism in the microvasculature, then the larger vessels. And you know, in the smaller vessel hemostasis, petrolysis is responsible. In larger vessel, there is a coagulation pathway that is responsible. So, as the initial phenomenon is the microvascular thrombosis, so petrolate may have some role if we use in the initial part that is the mildly symptomatic cases that can prevent the microvascular thrombosis. So, it theoretical can be beneficial, but actual what is happening in the real life scenario. We have to depend on the more data that is going on. There is a phase three trial is going on. Still, the uh, Western countries are recruiting the uh, individuals to see how much and how much benefit we will get using aspirin in this group of people. Absolutely, Dr. Jyotir Mai Paul. There is a trial which is called as PEAC. PEAC means yes, protective yes. effect of aspirin in COVID patients. Yes, it yes. is going on in China in, in China. the Zhaijing Hospital, and it has started in a late April. The dose they are using of aspirin is 100 milligrams. 100 milligrams, yes. And 128 patients they are enrolling, and they are, they feel that trial will be over by June. So till yes. that trial comes, and they are enrolling people between 18 to 85, and in their inclusion criteria, they are having pulmonary involvement, and they are having symptomatic patients. But the onset time is less than 14 days. That are the inclusion criteria, and that is on clinical.gov. And UKI is the uh, principal investigator of that study. Sir, uh, okay, can we do, I would like to uh, add one small thing here. Uh, Please. Yeah, sir, there, there was a uh, means question, means uh, that is all, all the uh, doctors also, they ask in our hospital and all the patients, means we all have the data and we are generating the data for the symptomatic patients, maybe mild, moderate or severe, uh, whatever this uh, this of the COVID, COVID-19. But there is a thought that all the asymptomatic, asymptomatic COVID, COVID-19 patients who do not have any symptoms and who are recommended usually home isolation or, or quarantine, do they require a prophylactic aspirin? This was a debatable question which was, which was raised in a hospital last, last week. But as of now, the, all the data being generated, this is for the symptom patients, no matter how uh, the symptoms, how much the symptoms are, how less the symptoms are, for the asymptomatic patients, we don't have any data as of now to recommend the regular use of or prophylactic use of the aspirin in the asymptomatic COVID COVID nineteen. So this is the point I wanted to make. But at the same time, in the same breath, we must say that people who are on aspirin therapy, low dose aspirin therapy, mm -hmm. we should not stop that. We, we should, should not discontinue that. that. We should not stop. Yeah, that yeah. Is. unless platelet count is below fifty thousand. Okay. Okay. Yes. Okay. okay. So, uh, uh, regarding the antiplatelet therapy, yes. what Professor Jyotirmal Pal sir mentioned, actually, it was the uh, theoretical, and it was absolutely right that we, if we want to stop that microvascular thrombosis, aspirin can be an option. But till we not get the evidence, then we, we cannot actually uh, recommend that. But 
if we talk about because in chat box we are uh, watching that there are different if, if we can use other anti platelets or f60 map like that but there is no recommendation and most probably if we if we go by the mechanistic way uh, there is a lesser effectiveness with okay. other anti platelets here the aspirin is beneficial why not because of that thromboxane a2 inhibition and it is important to actually acknowledge that there is an hyperthromboxane A2 in COVID patient that's shown in few hematological uh, studies. So that is why the aspirin is important, but other antiplatelet is not that much important in this context. And specifically, as we are dealing with uh, venous thromboembolism more, so that is why we are more trusting on the anticoagulant drugs rather than antiplatelet drugs. Sir, your comment. Right, right. So, uh, if there are no further issues, uh, I think we can uh, what we we can possibly conclude today's session. Uh, we have noted uh, the all the questions that have been put. More or less, most of them have been uh, replied or have been answered. If there are some question which has not been answered, we'll, we'll have to consider that. And uh, we have uh, most of the participants who registered their email ID are with us. We'll try to give a summary uh, sent to you all through a mail as a follow up of today's activity. The other agenda is uh, that also I'll again request Dr. Joshi to consider that uh, if we wish to follow this up further with some follow-up activity, particularly this group, whether they can keep on the, this discussion in a dedicated WhatsApp group, maybe for coming couple of weeks on the same theme as the newer information is evolving to be involved in their interaction in the dedicated uh, WhatsApp group, starting with these few people, difficulty and the others, and if necessary, other people can also join. This is my proposal. And then, of course, for data generation, evidence generation, uh, trying in a more formal manner, try to generate data in our own workplace, engaging small clinical trials, or rather, if not uh, randomized control trials, but good, well-designed observational study will also help us in generating good data and uh, creating or, or uh, giving opportunity for generating good hypothesis. With these few words, I think, Time is, uh, we have to call it a day. And I must thank profusely Dr. Shashank Joshi. In the last minute, he has agreed to be with us. And also the other faculty, Professor Jyotin Moipal, Dr. Shoibal Moitro, and uh, Dr. Yogi Raj, and uh, our friend Dr. Shambhu Samrat Samasdar. Thank you so very much for such a very meaningful discussion and interaction. We have been really wiser as we leave this platform today and with a place to do and contribute effectively in our in developing our knowledge base. Thank you again. Good, good night to everybody. Thank you.